Is that it, really? Is that okay? okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Look, I, I only have about thirty minutes, uh, so I'm going to try to cover. I'm going to try to rip through the slides quick, so there's plenty of time for questions because this is a very broad topic. Right, and so I know you all will all have a lot of questions, but we'll try to cover it um, uh, in a big way. That's the QRC code for my contact information. Uh, I, at the very last slide, there'll be a QRC code so you can download the entire slide presentation, so you don't have to worry about um, taking pictures of each slide. And, and as I go through this, <clears throat> um, there's more information on the slide than I can cover in 30 minutes. Right, so I'm going to sort of flash the slides, give you kind of a headline, but since you can download the entire presentation, you can read all the text later. Does that sound good? All right. <clears throat> so uh, let me just tell you just a little bit about me. Uh, my background is I've uh, spent some time in the Army and in, uh, infantry and in intelligence. I then spent about 15 years traveling all over the world, visiting different companies, assessing that their their IT systems uh, to see if they were, could qualify for large government contracts. I uh, did a lot of work in China. I did about 20 different assessments in China uh, all over the world. Uh, and then in 2016, my son bought a few dollars worth of Bitcoin. And when he sold them, he paid for a motorcycle, a car, his college tuition, and his living expenses. And I hated him. <laughs> I loved him, but I also hated him. So I got, I got a little interested in, um, in, in Bitcoin, and then I started finding out about blockchain I wanted to get in the space, so we held a meetup in August of 2016. It was a room pretty much like this, marketed it like crazy. I knew it would be big in government. Um, 20 minutes into the event, our second guest showed up, and uh, and we were somewhat demoralized. So we started meeting in, libra in libraries and conference rooms and restaurants, and um, and today we have about 15,000 people in about 100 cities around the world, right? So um, so what I'm about to show you is a compilation of of my experiences traveling all over the world, talking to people about blockchain, primarily from a government uh, context. So I want to start off uh, with telling you a little bit about where we are. I believe that blockchain is the most transformative technology in human history. And the reason is because blockchain does something that no other technology has done. Blockchain reverses the concentration of power. So in human societies, we have gone from tribes to villages to kingdoms, city-states, and as our ability to communicate and our technology has improved, our ability to control, coordinate, uh, and, and govern has grown. So that now we're governing on literally global scales because of the technology. This technology is the first thing that it decentralizes and pushes it in the opposite direction. That's why I believe it is so transformative. Blockchain, as a result, introduces an entirely new paradigm. So what are we talking about a paradigm, when we talk about paradigm shifts? Paradigms are the lenses that we look at. We're still looking at the same world, but we're seeing different opportunities and different constraints. And blockchain allows us to look at problems, situations, in ways that we never could before. And when that happens, there are winners and losers. Why? Because of this. Some people, some of you know people on both sides of that picture. So let's talk about paradigms. Here's some favorite ones. The Americans have need for the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. That was 1876. Uh, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a fad. Right? That was in 1903 from Henry Ford's lawyer. This was great. Uh, the president of IBM in 1943, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Televisions won't be able to hold out any market share that it captures. It, after the first six months, people will get tired of looking at a plywood box every night. 20th Century Fox, 1946. Cellular phones, will, cellular phones will absolutely not replace local wiring systems. Right? That was 1981. I predict the Internet will soon go spectacularly supernova and in 1996 catastrophically collapse. <clears throat> Robert Metcalf was a, the founder of 3Com. 1995. Now, this is a little bit more in our space. I'll, I'll just, you guys can all read this, right? I'll just give you a minute to read these. And then a little later. So if you look at who made these statements, right? It's Reuters, J, J.P. Morgan Chase, right? The Washington Post, CNBC. These are not idiots, right? But there's a paradigm Right? These people represent sort of traditional mar market forces. 
And paradigms often outweigh facts, right? How many people know people like this? <laughs> and wrong paradigms have consequences. So the headlines all over the world when the Titanic took, um, set sail was God himself couldn't sink the Titanic. It was on the front page of the New York Times and the London Times. And people in the shipping industry believed this. And they believed it so much that when the SS California literally saw the Titanic sinking, they literally saw the tail end of the ship up in the air. They didn't believe their own eyes. So paradigms are very, very strong, and, and wrong paradigms have consequences. Let's talk about some government paradigms. The role of government is to monitor, influence, and control. Governments continually seek to improve monitoring, influence, and control. Now, this is not bad. Good governance that good governments that monitor, influence, control do that for the, for, for the benefit of the citizens. Bad governments do it for the benefit of themselves. Financial systems and information, are, information systems are tools to help governments monitor, influence, and control. And governments have sovereignty over financial and information systems. Now, here's where blockchain impacts those paradigms. In the area of economic sovereignty, right? We have global and regional governments, we have national governments, but now we have these things called private currencies and public currencies, like, like Bitcoin. And blockchain it impacts the, it, 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 it impacts the function of money. <clears throat> so traditionally, we've thought of money as having three primary purposes, right? A medium of exchange, a unit of account, and the store of value. But in 1970, the United States passed the Bank Secrecy Act, which turned money into a means of control, which said that now financial institutions were an arm of the government. Right? So that means that they had to make, make certain reports. They had to, they, they basically, there was a benefit to law enforcement. The problem is, <clears throat> if you're a means of control, you're not a very good medium of exchange or a unit of account or a store of value. Because how, it, how well is, how good is something as a, as a store of value if the government can come in and take it? Or how good is it as a medium of exchange if the government comes in, comes in and says, you know what, you can't trade with that country because we have sanctions against it? So, so there was this sort of challenge. And, and let's talk about information for a second. The, so it's not just governments, but it's companies like these that have a tremendous influence over the information that's, that citizens deal with. In fact, these couple companies represent one-third of all advertising uh, dollars spent in the world. So here's the challenge. The, the, power, the, the traditional power paradigm, people organize into institutions. People subordinate themselves to institutions. Institutions make rules. The institutions enforce rules with power. Technology facilitates the concentration of power, and powerful institutions are corrupt. Why? Lord Acton said it when he said, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power uh, corrupts absolutely. Great men are, always, are almost always bad men. Not always, but al almost always. So let's, let's take a look at, with that said as a background, the history of blockchain so that we have an idea of where we are today. 2008, where were we? Greatest financial crisis uh, that the world had seen at that point, right? Banks were too big to fail, right? <clears throat> big government bailouts. So the, the response in the, in the U.S., we, we saw this movement called Occupy Wall Street, right? <clears throat> and this is essentially this global economic downturn and, and, and also referred to as a Great Recession. Now, the reason these newspapers are down here is because... <clears throat> When this happened in 2008, somebody, some group, under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto, wrote this white paper. Have any of you guys read the white paper? Okay. <clears throat> so basically, they said, hey, I got this idea for sort of this peer to peer currency, right? And in the very Genesis block of the very first block of the Bitcoin blockchain, the headlines from the, the, the London Times about the, the big bank bailouts were there. So this was, an, this was a motivation for where this thing got started. And his idea was, I think that you and I can transfer money back and forth, and instead of relying on a bank, we can all together 
develop a consensus on who has how much money in which address. So we can create a financial system that's totally decentralized. And <clears throat> where we were at the time was a tremendous dis distrust of large institutions. Wells Fargo Bank, <clears throat> you know, they're creating fake accounts. And if we look at this historically, it wasn't just the last election or the last two or three elections. This has been a global trend for decades. And it was in that, it was in that space that this wave of populism started growing around the world. In my country, it led to uh, folks like Donald Trump and, and Bernie Sanders, who were different political parties, but they represented the same idea, right? Essentially, uh, anti-establishment. In Brexit, we saw the same thing. And this trend has been something we've been seeing globally. So then uh, a, a couple of people started um, picking up the idea. The first Bitcoin transaction was May of uh, um, 2010. It was 10,000 Bitcoins for two pieces. Anybody know what the Bitcoin price is today? A couple, yeah. So we started seeing a couple people start to pick it up, and we started seeing Bitcoin ATMs. And so Bitcoin was the first uh, cryptocurrency. We started seeing a couple more, and then more. So today there's literally thousands of cryptocurrencies. And an entire ecosystem has grown up around it. Now, what's interesting is this ecosystem is, is generally outside the financial institutions and the, the governed ecosystems that exist. And it's global. And it's parallel. And it's something that, that governments and large institutions are really worried about. And it's small, and it's big, and it's decentralized. People started getting really interested in this. So this represents, and, and <clears throat> this chart is a little bit old, but it's from Google Trends, and it shows the, uh, the searches for the word blockchain. And it also shows the countries where those searches uh, appeared in order. Now, interestingly enough, and I, I presented this initially to an audience in the, U in the U.S., look at all the countries that, are, that had more searches by number than the U.S. did. Right? Some are very rich and some are very poor. Any idea why, why so many of those countries essentially had more searches for blockchain than, than the U.S.? You can, you can talk. I can. So in some cases, there's more corruption. Exactly. That's, that's why some of maybe the poor nations. Well, why, what about the richer nations? They've got a better technology foundation or footprint, right? They're, they're looking for innovation. They're looking for jobs, economic, economic success, absolutely. So one of the criticisms was, well, Bitcoin is just not very stable. And they're right. Take a look at the chart. If, I, if in 2009 I took $1 and, and I bought, at that time I could have bought 500 Bitcoins, in 10 years look how much my dollar would be worth versus those 500 Bitcoins. Bitcoin absolutely is not stable. <laughs> in fact, we had an event in, um, uh, uh, actually, my, my college alma mater, and one of the speakers was um, Hans Timmer. He's a senior economist from the, uh, from the World Bank. <clears throat> and, he said, and he said it to a room filled with about 200 you know, uh, crypto and blockchain enthusiasts. <sighs> Poor guy. He said, um, Bitcoin, unlike sovereign currency is made out of nothing. It didn't go over real well. <clears throat> One of the questions he got asked was, well, when the U.S. expands its money supply, if it's not made out of nothing, what is it made out of? And his response was, is this session being recorded? Now, I will tell you that um, early on, I started looking at this, and I said, wow, this Bitcoin thing is going to turn into something. And uh, the price was low, and then the price went went up high, and everybody thought I was a genius. And then the price crashed, and everybody laughed at me and said I was an idiot, right? What I remember thinking at the time, and, and it, it crashed and then stayed down for a long time, but I, what I remember thinking is the reasons why I thought this was a good idea when the price was down low never changed 
when they went up high, and it didn't change when it went low. So what you have to realize is the principles behind the ascendancy of this cryptocurrency, right, are are fundamental, and unless those principles change, you shouldn't expect different behavior. So don't, because it's very small and it's volatile, you'll see a lot of ups and downs, but you shouldn't use that to make decisions. You should make the principles, uh, the factors that you use for the decisions. The value of cryptocurrency today is larger than all of these uh, national GDPs. And again, you'll, you get a copy of these slides if you want. So Bitcoin was the first major blockchain. Then there was a fork uh, called Ethereum. And then all of these. So besides there being lots of cryptocurrencies, there's now lots of different blockchains, different technologies, different uses, different capabilities. And with that came the rise of the ICOs. So everybody and their mother said, hey, listen, if I got this great idea. If we put blockchain on, on here, we write a white paper, we'll get millions and millions of dollars of investment. And that's what you saw happen. And, and everybody and their mother jumped into this thing. The problem was 80% of them were scams. The fraud, you know, the fraud, the incompetence, it was a get-rich-quick. It was like a gold rush. All the fools jumped into this thing. So government reacted to that. They did it with regulation. Banks all over the world had all sorts of different opinions. Some said, hey, you know what? This is a great opportunity. We want to be the world's leader in it. Other people said, this is straight from the devil, and we've got to ban it because it'll destroy society. And so all around the world... And, and in my country, we see this eclectic pattern of regulation. Some countries are welcoming this thing like crazy. Other people essentially are, are downright banning it. But let's stop talking about cryptocurrency. Let's talk about government use cases. So with this technology, and unfortunately I don't have the time to explain how it works, <clears throat> we start, these, are, these represent different working groups that we have currently working on the use of blockchain in all of these different areas. I'm going to talk, because I can't talk about all of them uh, in this talk, in the 12 minutes that I have left, I want to talk about two areas, financial, regulatory, and law enforcement. But there's politics. So this guy that you see here on the right, uh, the president of Cameroon, he's been the president of Cameroon since 1982 in democratically uh, run fair elections. And he said, you, look, using blockchain for voting is not secure. He's won every election since 1982. <clears throat> so, to tell you a little bit about how blockchain impacts this country, um, we were invited to Cameroon, and I was meeting with the ICT minister. She reports directly to the president. She said, we're interested in all the blockchain use cases that I just showed you, except for voting. Our voting system works just the way we like it. But here's the problem that they faced. Um, uh, Cameroon's a French-speaking country, right? They have an English-speaking group that essentially uh, don't like the way things are run and, and have basically started a rebellion. That rebellion, um, those... You know, they started, they started killing people and, you know, burning down villages. It was, you know, somewhat awkward. They launched an ICO. And so they're now, they, cre they created an ICO to fund their revolution. So the Cameroonian government asked us to come in and advise them on what to do. So this thing is, this thing is kind of bubbling up for governments in all kinds of ways that nobody really anticipated. I said we're going to cover two areas. Let's, let's talk about blockchain and financial systems. So we're seeing around the world, some countries are, uh, are jumping in. Here's some example, Malta, Bermuda, Switzerland. These folks are really creating a pro-blockchain cryptocurrency uh, environment, a positive one. And then there's less favorable ones. I believe in India, I don't know if it's still true, but at one point they just outright banned it. The United States has a regulatory environment that's driving all the innovation outside the United States. China, uh, uh, they had banned it, and then, and then they brought it back in, and um, there's some back and forth. But here's a great uh, quote by Andreas uh, Antonopoulos. 
you can take your country out of Bitcoin, but you can't take Bitcoin out of your country. Which means I can kill all the jobs, I can kill all the innovation, I can drive all of that out of the country, but it's the distributed system that is ubiquitous. So I can't get rid of it, it's, it's here. So let's talk about the banks. <clears throat> Over 40 central banks right now around the world are in, in the process of developing their own central bank digital currency, wholesale central bank digital systems. We've got an entire presentation on banking and financial systems. I wish I could tell you all. All i got to say is the banks are in this like crazy because what they said was the world's going this way. If you can't beat them, join them. And then once you've joined them, then crush them. But there's a lot of folks in the banking industry that want to maintain organizations as they stand, so they're getting in this thing as a matter of survival. <clears throat> Here's just an example of, of central bank digital currencies. Again, you can read it when you download the presentation. Then tech companies and financial institutions have been racing into this thing. This is a, a chart of the number of patents filed so far. And look at this. It's IBM, Bank of America, it's Intel, MasterCard. There's a there's a fusion right now of tech companies and financial institutions. Why is this important? The government regulatory environment is all focused on financial institutions, not on tech companies. Did any of you guys see the Libra hearings? <clears throat> so when Libra uh, folks testified in front of Congress, I will tell you, and, I, and I've met with, with congressional uh, folks, they're terrified of this. But it's a tech company, and all of the financial tools don't work in the, in the tech space. There's a bill, I can't remember the name of the bill that's been drafted, it hasn't been passed, that, that if passed would find tech companies a million dollars a day for holding or interacting with cryptocurrency within one year of the time the bill is passed. Now, I don't think that bill will be passed, but it shows you the level of, of uh, uh, I don't know, concern that governments have with tech companies. Let's talk about law enforcement for a minute. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in law enforcement, the, the, the term you'll hear all the time is follow the money, right? And it, I, I talked about the Bank, Bank Secrecy, Secrecy Act, right? It changed money. We talked a little bit about this before, right? Before, money had to perform all kinds, all the functions, but today... Tokens perform, can perform some of those functions better than others. So Bitcoin's a great store of value long term, but it's not a great, great thing to use if I'm going to buy a cup of coffee at the coffee shop, just because of the, I don't necessarily need 51% of all the computers in the world to validate my, my coffee purchase, right? So now other types of what, uh, Lightning Network and other types of, of tokens are being developed for different purposes. Cities are developing their own local currency. Right? So, for example, there could be uh, an Abu Dhabi coin, right? And Bitcoin is not capable of handling every transaction in the world, but we could create a cryptocurrency that's decentralized that could handle all of the Abu Dhabi transactions. And so my wallet might, you know, I might transact with all of you in my local community, and then at the end of the day, the week, the month, I, I reconcile with the Abu Dhabi blockchain, and maybe at the end of the month, the Abu Dhabi blockchain reconciles with the Bitcoin blockchain, so I, I reduce the number of transactions, but, but Bitcoin can become the global unit of account that all of these other tokens uh, function with. We don't know. But different tokens are being built for different purposes. One of the ones that really causes governments a lot of concern are privacy coins. So what privacy coins do is they take all of the inputs... They mesh them all together, they scramble them, and then they, they send out the outputs. Which means law enforcement can't tell where the money came from or where, or where it went. The crypto market right now is 2.2, I'm sorry, $222.8 billion in 10 years. And then we've got Bitcoin ATMs. So here's a map of where some of the ATMs that we know about are located. There's no KYC, there's no AML, any criminal, anybody who wants to, to circumvent the law can go to any of these, these locations. And there's no regulations that, that handle them. And then we have exchanges. 
So some exchanges are regulated, but a lot are not. The ones that are decentralized, we don't even know who to go to to, to enforce it. And once all of us start doing peer-to-peer -peer transactions without going through any financial institution, governments completely lose their ability, their visibility to monitor, influence, and control. So, I got four minutes left. Uh, there's way more we could talk about. Uh, well, hopefully we'll have some questions. Oh, great, there are some already. Um, but let me give you some resources. So I'll tell you again a little bit about the Government Blockchain Association. We're an unbiased, non-lobbying trade association. We're really created to help the public and the private sector connect, communicate, and collaborate to find solutions with blockchain. Here's currently where we have our chapters. We do uh, working groups, uh, professional networking, collaborate. We're, we have, we're essentially like a social media platform. We do training certifications. We do blockchain project support, concierge service. Here are some of our working groups. So the way the working groups work is the government folks, anybody in, in government can join GBA for free. They come to the working groups and they say, here's our... Here's the problems that we're looking at. Here's what we're trying to solve. And, and the private sector folks say, here's our use cases, here's our white papers, here's our demos, here's our, here's our, uh, our solution. And we just let the government and the private industry figure it out. Each of our working groups uh, create their own charter. They create content and solutions that we deploy throughout the, work, throughout the chapters globally. Again, we have a social media platform back end. And again, it's, it's free for anybody in government to use. Here's some of our certification courses. Each of our working groups are in the process of creating their own blockchain certification uh, courses and standards. As an example, we've got a financial regulatory one. If you went to our website, it would look like this. As an example, here's one of the companies uh, in the law enforcement group, the blockchain intelligence group. That's the QRC code to get to them. They've got a variety of products. And again, this is just a, an example of the kinds of stuff that you find on our website. So they've got a bunch of products to help law enforcement, intelligence, and defense people do data analytics of blockchains. An example of some of their tools. So we got some really high quality folks in the GBA. And more examples of their tools. They do risk scoring, all, all kinds of stuff. And I got two minutes and 17 seconds left. If you want the presentation, you can download it on that QRC code. And uh, I got a couple, I got two minutes for questions. Good? Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Alexandra is my name. Um, you said we can create localized tokens and, you know, exchange between us money and so on and so forth. And maybe they have to take, to make a profit somehow, Abu Dhabi, so they will go into Bitcoin. But if everybody goes into Bitcoin, isn't that eventually becoming a bit centralized? I, I'm not sure I really understand your question. So... So let me kind of let me kind of go back a, a little bit. Yeah. So in terms of anybody can create a token, um, the Ethereum blockchain has a standard called uh, ERC twenty. Well, there's a couple, um, and with about eight lines of code, you can create your own your own token, right? Um, and you could do that on Ethereum and never even connect to Bitcoin, right? Uh, there's other there's other technologies like the Lightning Network, right? And what they do is they they, they create um, on the Lightning Network, for example, all of us, so I, had, I know you and I have a relationship with you, right? I, I know Kathy over here and I, I know some of you guys. So I could have a payment channel, right? And all of us could have payment channel. And then the Lightning Network essentially allows money to move across this, this, uh, these interconnected channels. And then periodically we reconcile with the Bitcoin network. There's a lot of different technologies, uh, that, that allow this. Yeah. And, and incidentally, many of those technologies are centralized and many are decentralized. So some companies say, hey, I got a great idea. I'm like a bank. Let me create this cryptocurrency and it's centralized, right? Other folks have created decentralized ones. And the question, if you go back to the, the trends, the, the societal trends, I believe that the more decentralized options there are, 
people are going to want to go there because they don't like the fact that Google and Facebook and everything monitors everything about them, right? This desire to be free, I think, will move people in that direction. However, these centralized people, they've created very easy systems. And so a lot of people are saying, I don't care about being monitored. I like the ease of use. I don't, I don't know how it'll work out. Yeah, I think it's a generational thing. It depends who you're talking about. Yeah. Because I think our generation gave up some privacy rights for connectivity and ease. Right, we could have an entire conversation about privacy and GDPR. I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's such a big topic. And the fun question, you know, the 80% failure of... Uh, it's probably 90 or 93. Yeah, <laughs> but do you think, I mean, your personal opinion, and I think we are recorded, <laughs> governments might have been behind that one to diminish the trust of people in Bitcoin when, you know, just curves the... Now, listen, I think incompetency is rampant, right? I, they didn't need any help from the government. They, this was a bunch of folks. It was... Speculative. It, speculative. Yeah. yeah, pure. Okay. Yeah. There's a question back here. See, I, want, I, I have a question in a sense. Uh, you didn't never mention about Libra. How much the Facebook will control the lives of the people in the world? And uh, apart from the fiat currency, and they would cover, uh, control all the mutual funds if it ever comes into existence. What is your comment? And uh, I'm amazed that uh, you also didn't mention that kind of a framework. So um, I mentioned it. It was just a, it was just a quick sentence. Um, so in, in the in the long view, I. I don't think Libra really has much of a chance. I think uh, f f uh, already there's a, a member of the association who've pulled out. Uh, the regulators are going to come down on, on it hard. I, I'm surprised that they actually made the announcement, not having any idea of the of the challenges that they would face. Uh, it was very informative. It, it put it on the radar screen for um, uh, for regulators. It, it, it put it out as a conversation. It's probably one of the most studied white papers, I think, that have, that have come out. But um, at the end of the day, I don't think they'll be able to accomplish what they'd like to accomplish. It, that's just my opinion. You got to be quicker, otherwise, I got to like tell a joke or something like that. <laughs> I'll run. It's like it's like when you're on a long right. car ride with somebody you don't know, right? So uh, you mentioned uh, that the financial institutions uh, have this idea of join them and then later destroy them. Can you elaborate on a scenario where how they would destroy them? What do you mean by that? Well, the question is, do they understand? So I, I had the opportunity of speaking to a, a group of central bankers in New York maybe about a year ago, right? And uh, and, uh, you know, when, when you talk to large groups, a lot of times people are on their phones and they're on their laptops and stuff like that. In this particular meeting, there's not a single person on their phone or look, they were, they were, they were in total rapt attention, right? Um, if you remember some of the quotes, right, from JP Morgan Chase and Jamie Dimon and stuff like that, their initial comments were, this is a scam, it'll never work. At the same time, they were filing for patents, right? Um, what they realized is when, when banks could start doing cross-border payments and cutting out the central banks, and when they started seeing what people could do with, with cryptocurrencies, right, they recognized that if they didn't get in that space um, and dominate it, they would be Ubered out of it. And, and since, um, since people have a, um, um, a tr they trust Things like uh, you know Bank of America and Wells Fargo, and the the, the mood was um, you know Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is just for drug dealers and uh, you know they're trying to create this this environment you can't trust it. It's the, their public statements, right? Was it's uh, it's not stable. It's you know, all of these things that it, it would fail because they wanted to get a dominant position in, in the space. So it's a public relations war more than anything else. I guess we'll go to the sliders then. It's your show. All right. What are your views? Oh, what are the, your views on the future of cryptocurrency? 
Look, I, I'm not giving you investment advice. I will just tell you that I think that a Bitcoin eventually goes about 500 million. I think that there are a couple others. Uh, I think that there will eventually be a suite of cryptocurrencies that are used for particular uh, purposes. Um, but they will, you'll have a phone, and basically when you go to pay for something, your phone will probably identify which token makes the most sense. You'll pay in that token, and your phone will do all the work in the background. Cryptocurrencies, don't they have a negative impact on the worldwide economy? Depends on who you ask. There are some people that say the way the world works now is great, and they would say it has a devastating impact. There are other people that say uh, that it's unfair, there's many unbanked, and they, those people would say it's got a, a positive impact. Can blockchain be used for anything else besides cryptocurrency? I think we covered that one. Uh, does the decentralized nature of blockchain make it more secure? I was wondering, this is a cybersecurity event. So our cybersecurity working group is, uh, is working on a whole variety of solutions to decentralize cybersecurity, right? So right now, one of the challenges we have is with these hacks is you break into a a database, you get everybody's financial information, their social security numbers. Um, there, there's work being done looking at distributed DNSs, right, domain name servers. So right now, if somebody breaks into a DNS, <clears throat> and um, and so I'll just use Wells Fargo, if they, if they change that entry so that the name wellsfargo.com now points to a new IP address, you now come to my IP address where I essentially spoof the Wells Fargo uh, uh, web page, you put in your account information, your username and password, I then go in and take all your money. Right? A decentralized uh, a DNS would, um, uh, would address things like that. So there, there's just so many from a cybersecurity perspective, there, there's so many. Uh, on our website, if you go to the working groups, or actually if you just, um, in the search bar, just type the word cybersecurity, you'll get a ton of articles on blockchain and cybersecurity. Environment cryptocurrency, um, Cryptocurrency mining consumes a lot of energy. Um, pollute, pollute for what real added value? We've got to compare apples to apples, right? So what's a, what's a, a, a main bank here in, in the UAE? What's the biggest bank in the UAE? Or, or in the Middle East? What is it? Okay. So... Do they consume any energy? Do they have buildings? Do they have data centers? Do their, do their employees have to drive to and from work? Do they have to hire HR people? So if you look at, if you look at the, the energy that goes into um, validating transactions and you compare it with the alternative system, I don't know that you can make a case one way or the other. Right? Um, secondly, there's a lot of different um, consensus algorithms that use different methods, right? There's proof of stake, there's all sorts of other proofs that essentially are not on the high energy uh, use scale. And then thirdly, what most people don't understand is that the algorithm itself self-adjusts. So if the energy costs get too high, and we've seen this happen in the mining space, the energy costs get too high, it was not profitable to mine. So then what happened was a lot of people stepped out of the mining business, which meant that there were less miners. And so the algorithm automatically adjusts the difficulty level down, so it now requires less energy in order to mine. And these are nuances that most people don't understand. The banks, the people that do not want this to fail, essentially will make this case, but there really is not enough data to, to really substantiate that case. And what are some of the... Oh, the, the other thing is, if you really think that we shouldn't use the technology because of the consumption of energy, how much did the, uh, the Internet impact our energy consumption? And would you make a case that we should stop using the Internet because it just uses too much energy? What are some of the blocks... Uh, okay, so we already covered this one, the, uh, the cybersecurity. All right. Dude, I am so sorry. I, I went over... All right, so I'll be around. Um, I'll be uh, in the back if anybody has any questions. Again, this is a QRC code for... No, it's not up anywhere. Anyway, uh, if, you need, if you need the presentation or anything like that, I'd be happy to, to share it. All right, I'm done.
Thank you very much, Gerard.